Let's take our Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter number 61. Isaiah chapter number 61. And we will read a few verses here in Isaiah 61. As you're finding your place, if you don't mind standing for the reading of God's word here in Isaiah. Isaiah 61, and we'll begin reading in verse number one. We read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, uh, to uh, preach good tidings unto the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this passage that's in front of us. God, I pray that you'd use it uh, to even comfort our hearts tonight. And to just make us uh, just aware of, of your goodness and your beauty uh, at work in uh, redemption. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, how many of you recently have had a song that's been just stuck in your head? Anyone that happened to anybody? I, I know that's happened to all of us at one time or another. How many parents I, do I have in here that have had the song... The great song of the faith, Baby Shark, stuck in your head before. That's a bad one. Or it's a small world, maybe equally as bad. I was reading an article this past week that talked about tips to get songs that are stuck in your head out of your head. Uh, one tip was to complete the song. I don't know how that helps, but that was one tip. Just complete the song. Another tip was to do a crossword puzzle. Another tip was to chew gum. Uh, but this time of year, we hear a lot of songs repeated, don't we? And I actually like the songs that we hear repeated, the Christmas songs. I love uh, walking into a store or hearing on the radio Christmas songs that are familiar, that we hear year after year. I read just recently that the most repeated Christmas song of all time is Silent Night. There are 733 copyrighted recordings of Silent Night. That's almost double of how many songs there are of joy to the world. And of course, the most repeated song in recent history every year is All I Want for Christmas, Mariah Carey. Some of you already knew that. So some songs are worth repeating and others you wish you just could get out of your head, right? Well, we're entering the Christmas season and here we are on the doorstep of December. And there are some, just like there are some songs that you never get tired of, in Scripture there are truths that we should never tire of. Songs that are worth repeating, repeating again and again and again. So tonight, our prayer as we approach God's Word is that perhaps He would rekindle our heart to some truths that have been familiar to us for some time. And so here in this passage, if you're taking notes, we find three reasons for our joy that are worth repeating. There's a lot of reasons to be dep dis depressed, right? We can all talk about that. We can, we can go around the room and we'd be here all night to talk about all the depressing reasons to be sad right now. But there are some true meanings for reasons for joy, and we find them here in this passage. And so I want to draw your attention to them if you're taking notes. Number one, the goodness of God. The goodness of God. So here in our text, verse number one, we read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings. Now, this is just the introductory verse, but there's a lot of goodness right here in this verse. To preach good tidings. What is, it, what is a good tidings? We hear this in our, in our Christmas story. A good tidings of great joy. We hear this this time of year. What is good tidings? Well, in Exodus, there's a passage where we hear of evil tidings. And it was in Exodus 33 when God tells the children of Israel that he's not going to go with them into the promised land. And Moses, uh, representing the children of uh, Israel, says this is evil tidings to be here without you, to go there without your presence. This is bad news. And so if that's bad news, good news is God's presence 
with us. This is, this is goodness. And later on in the passage in Exodus, uh, God said, I will make my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. So God's goodness to us is manifest in so many ways. But I think as we enter the Christmas season, one of the reasons we can really be thankful for that our God is good is that he's with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Us. And so the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings. Now, Isaiah's writing this passage, and there's not a lot that we know about Isaiah. Isaiah's name means Yahweh is salvation, and that is not just his name, that's evident in his writing. Uh, Isaiah is quoted more in the New Testament than any other book, it stands apart just theologically in the Old Testament. And there are a number of messianic prophecies given in Isaiah. There are prophecies. And what is a messianic prophecy? This is a a prophecy that is about Christ, before Christ, in Isaiah's case about 700 years. And it's fulfilled by Christ. And there's there's a number of these uh, in the book of Isaiah. And throughout Scripture, there are 330 prophecies concerning Christ's coming. 110 of them refer to his first coming, and 220, exactly double the amount, refer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, many of these prophecies are found here in the book of Isaiah. And you will hear these verses quoted uh, throughout the month here at Lancaster Baptist. And so Isaiah's prophecies, they cover Christ's birth, Christ's ministry, his suffering, the brutality of his death, the resurrection, and the second coming of Jesus. But Isaiah 61, which we just read from, is is special even amongst those. Uh, Isaiah 61 is special because it it paints for us this this special portrait of redemptive history. What do we mean by redemptive history? Redemptive history is the series of events by which God is redeeming his people, redeems his people from sin. It is a narrative that is ultimately fulfilled in Christ. And this is the, this is the overarching theme of Scripture is God redeeming his people. And we see that really right from the beginning, the fall uh, to the first gospel, Genesis 3.15. And you see redemption thread all throughout Scripture. So this is, this is a great snapshot of redemptive history. Up in Washington, where my wife is from, we try to visit there around Christmas time. It's a beautiful state. And uh, here's a photo of a hiking trail up in Washington. This is a hiking trail on Mount Rainier, and it's beautiful. And to be on the trail uh, provides some spectacular beauty. But for me, if you want to see the real beauty of Mount Rainier, you got to move even further back. And if you've ever been to Washington, you've seen Mount Rainier. It doesn't matter if you're an hour north of Seattle or an hour south of Seattle. Am I right, Brother Crockett? It's just a beautiful mountain that you can't miss from every angle. And to be on the trail provides its own spectacular beauty. But to pull back and to see it in all of its beauty, especially I like seeing it with the the houses right before because it gives the the scale, the magnitude of them. If you're going to go climb Mount Everest, you're going to practice on Mount Rainier. And so it's a beautiful mountain, but there's beauty provided on the trail up close and personal. But when you pull back and and see the the wideness of it, it provides another spectacular context, right? So when we, there, there are some spectacular moments in Scripture that if you examine them closely, there's, there's beauty in them. The birth of Christ would be one of the greatest. But really what provides beauty in the birth of Christ is when you zoom back and you see that that birth in the cradle is connected to the cross. That's the whole reason that Jesus came. And so Isaiah gives us this panoramic, this wide view of redemptive history of what God is doing. And one of the things, from time to time, maybe you've done this before as well, uh, but I'll be driving with my kids around sunset and I'll say, man, didn't God just paint a beautiful sunset? Because that's God's beauty, right? It elicits that response from us. Well, when we come to a passage like Isaiah 61, it should also elicit a response from us that God is good. His work is beautiful. And so continue reading here. Psalms, or, uh, Isaiah 61, verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Because the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings. Now, by the way, God is fully good. Every part of God is good. Uh, Sometimes uh, people have this idea that, well, there's God the Father, and he's he's a bit scarier than Jesus, who's nicer. And then there's the Holy Ghost, who's for the charismatics, right? That's not not how it is. God is good. He's fully good. He's good. Here we find the Trinity, one God, three persons. Not three manifestations. He doesn't shape shift eternally present, 
uh, Godhead, the deity of Christ, we are the trinity of Christ. We see the spirit here in verse number one, the spirit, we see the Lord God and me. Now, who is me? I'll tell you this, spoiler alert, alert, it is not Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet. He's a mouthpiece for God. But me in this passage, although Isaiah is the human instrument, he's not the me referred to in Isaiah chapter number 61. And so God is good because the same God that said, let us make man in our image, then mankind rebels, rejects God, falls, uh, feels the weight, the effect of fall, rejects God in his goodness, and yet God is still good to us. So we can very quickly skim over a verse, like verse number one of Psalm 61, and think that the Spirit of the Lord of God is upon me, the Lord hath appointed me to preach good tidings. But if you stop and think, but why? Like the psalmist said it this way, who is, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Like why would, why is God mindful of us? Why would he appoint a Messiah to preach good news of deliverance? I think this just highlights the goodness of God. Psalm 98, verse 1 and 2, The Lord hath made known his salvation. Verse number 2, All that the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of God. God is the primary mover in salvation. And from that, our response should be, Man, God is good. He is good to us. Number two, the second reason to rejoice is not just the goodness of God, but we see here the grace of redemption. So the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Verse 1, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I said this a moment ago. How do we know, though, that the me here in Isaiah 61 is not speaking of Isaiah and is speaking of Jesus? Well, when you turn to the book of Luke, and you can actually turn there because we'll be there for a minute, Luke chapter number four, uh, we see in Luke two, of course, the birth of Christ. In Luke three, we see the baptism of Christ. And the beginning of uh, Luke chapter number four, we read that Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Then he's led by the Spirit. He's tempted of the devil. And then verse number 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. By the way, Christ as our perfect example. Here's two verses, and then also in the Old Testament, we see how closely connected and how, how he was filled with the Spirit, following the leading, the guiding of the Spirit. We read it in verse number 1 and in verse number uh, 14 that he returned in the power of the Spirit as he was led by the Spirit in verse number 1. If Christ as our example is led by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, how much more should we have need and reliance on the Holy Spirit as our example? Today we had a field trip at Lancaster Baptist School. We went down to the California Science uh, museum. I hadn't been there in a long time since. In fact, I was a kid, probably in fifth grade as well. And it's a pretty spectacular museum. And one of the coolest things that is at the Science uh, Museum is the Endeavour Space Shuttle. And here's a picture on the left of the Endeavour Space Shuttle as it was unveiled right here in Palmdale back in 1991. Some of you might remember this. Of course, completed missions going up to space. Uh, spectacular aircraft, and now it's retired. Uh, they're building another exhibit for it, so if you want to see it, you need to see it soon, or you won't be able to see it for about three years. And uh, so it was pretty neat to show my daughter Layton, uh, my nephew Can uh, Chandler there, and, and Blair just looking at it, the size of it, and just to look at something that's been into outer space is, is pretty neat. As we were walking away back to some of the other exhibits, because this exhibit is its own building, I look over to the left and I see, I thought it was like an orange wall, it was huge, but it caught my attention. And it was this. This is the fuel tank for the shuttle. The shuttle doesn't get anywhere near outer space without the fuel, right? And by the way, without the Holy Spirit, we don't get anywhere near accomplishing his will for our life in our own spirit, in our own will, in our, under our own volition, right? It is the Holy Spirit that guides us, leads us, empowers us. Christ here as our perfect example. So he returns in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went about, this is verse number 14 of Luke 4. And there went about the fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. 
So like we did here tonight, we're going to stand for the reading of God's word. The next verse says, And there was delivered unto him by the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he opened up the book, he found the place where it was written. I think I have a scroll somewhere here. Yep. So he, he's handed a scroll. The scroll, what we just read, is Isaiah. And they hand the scroll to Jesus to read, and he opens it up, and he finds the place. Now, it be a little difficult for us because on the scroll, there's no, there's no chapter, there's no, no verses. That doesn't come to later, the 13th and the 16th century, I believe, chapter and verse. So he finds Isaiah, and he goes, and he's very specific. He finds the spot, and here's, uh, it says, uh... In verse number 18, the Spirit of the Lord, oh, he opened the book and he found the place. So he went and found the place where it was written. Verse number 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to the minister and sat down. This doesn't mean that uh, he was done. In fact, the teacher would sit and the congregation would stand. How about we try that tonight? When, when, when Jesus was done reading, now he's going to teach, but he's going to go and sit down and the congregation would stand. In verse number uh, 21, we read, And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Isn't that cool? This is what Jesus is saying. Me is me. Me in Scripture, Isaiah chapter number 61. It's not Isaiah, it's not anyone else. It is me. I am the Messiah. Messiah meaning anointed one, by the way. Jesus is saying, so the Jews, they were familiar with the concept of the Messiah. They would talk about the concept of the Messiah. They would pray and wait and long for the anointed one. So so Jesus comes to his hometown, reads from Isaiah 61, where we just read a moment ago, and he said, that's me. That's me. Now, I told you Isaiah 61 is a special passage. That's the passage that Jesus selects to read from. Now, let's compare the two, though. Isaiah 61, verse 2. I'll read it to you if you you have both spots. Maybe you can compare alongside of me. 61, verse 2 says this. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. In Luke 4, 19, Jesus said, To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. So, any, any English grammar teachers here tonight? Punctuation's important, right? Punctuation's really important. Uh, if I say, let's eat, comma, grandma, that means it's time for dinner, grandma. If I say, let's eat, no comma, grandma, we got problems, right? Uh, that, that, that comma matters. That comma means something. In Isaiah 61, we see the proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. There is a comma there and the day of vengeance of our God. But when, when Jesus comes, he puts a period where there had been a comma. What is that comma? That comma is what we're living in right now, and that is the grace of God. That is the grace of redemption. So some of Isaiah's prophecies had multiple applications. Uh, this verse... This one verse applies to Christ, not only his first coming, but his second coming. And so what Jesus did was when he read and he stopped before we read and the day of vengeance of our God, because that wasn't that day. He couldn't read that and say today's the day because today was not the day. What he did say was, was this is the acceptable year of the Lord. In John 3, 17, we read, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That's something else we can rejoice about. That's something that we can rejoice on repeat, that now is the acceptable. Aren't you thankful for that? Apart from that, uh, there's no coming to Christ, right? This is... Because of God's grace, because now is the day of salvation, you heard the gospel, you received Christ. We have the ability to to share that good news with others as well. So let's take a look at the ministry of his redemption. It's fourfold here. Here's what we read. What What is Christ to do? To preach the gospel to the poor. To preach the gospel to the poor. This is not speaking of just being financially poor. You can be financially rich and spiritually poor. You can be uh, extraordinarily poor spiritually, uh, but then uh, 
financially rich, meaning uh, you can have all the riches of the world, not have Christ, you're poor. Uh, you can have Christ, and some of you have been to places where they had nothing, but they had Jesus, and Jesus was everything. I read this past week, maybe as you have, that the billionaire vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, Charlie Munger, died nearly 100 years old, left behind $782 billion. Here's a clipping I took from an article this afternoon. Throughout his long life, Charlie Munger didn't say too much about faith, though he did once say of his fortune, I don't need it where I'm going. I don't know if he knew Christ or not. I pray that he did. But he also continued to say, there's nothing as insignificant as an extra $2 billion to an old man. Meaning the older he got, the more it really didn't matter. Uh, $2 billion would mean a lot to us, right? We could do a lot with $2 billion. But to someone who has $782 billion, an extra $2 billion to an old man, he said there's nothing more insignificant than that. What does that tell us? Well, Paul said that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You know, sometimes during this time of year, we get a little materialistic. We go to uh, buy a Christmas list or put together a Christmas list or want something or want to even just provide something nice for our kids. And we look at the bank account. And you're like, how is this all going to make sense? And maybe during this time, you're at the end of the year and like, man, my bank account's depressing. Listen, if you have Christ, you have enough. If you have Christ, you have, as Paul said, unsearchable riches. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So the ministry of this Messiah, Jesus said to preach the gospel to the poor. In Isaiah, it says to the, to the meek. Then he said to heal the brokenhearted. In Isaiah, we read, bind up the brokenhearted. There are many, even in this room, who have been touched by tragedy, even this past week. There is in our world, there is not a loss for tragedy. There is pain, there is suffering, there is tragic loss, there is divorce. There's people that have been abused, people that have been lied to. Uh, There are people that have been cheated on, mistreated. There's no shortage of pain in this world, but you will never find more compassion than you find in Jesus. That's why the psalmist wrote that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up the brokenhearted, to preach, then it says, deliverance to the captives. Uh, There are many, we drive around in town, there are many that are captive because of sin. Uh, abusive behaviors, pornography, substance abuse, captive. Now, this doesn't mean that we won't sin once we come into a saving knowledge of Christ, but what it does mean, the message that Jesus preaches and what that, how that is realized in our life is that we may sin, but we are never subject to that sin. That sin is not our master any longer. So he came to preach deliverance to the captives and to give sight to the blind. Uh, in Colossians, Paul wrote about the dominion of darkness and, 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 and what it means to see the light of the gospel. And so that's the ministry of the Messiah. This is what Jesus came to do. Now, by the way, these truths are for us, right? Sometimes when we read a list like that, we talk about the, the captive, the blind, the poor. We think of other people. This is every single one of us apart from Jesus. It doesn't matter where you grew up, who your parents were, what you did or what you didn't do, apart from Jesus and his redemptive work, we are lost, we are blind, we are broken, we are captive. But for the grace of God and but for Jesus. So let's look closer at this redemption. What what does he do for us? Well, here in the passage we read just a moment ago that he he does some exchanges for us, right? Uh, this time of year, it's worth, as you do your, your Christmas shopping, it's worth asking what the exchange policy is. Have any of you ever bought th- something and you forgot to check on the exchange policy and then you go back and they say, no, all sales are final. That's always a bummer, right? There's some places that have really bad exchange policies. I think like if you're going to buy, uh, let's say, a camera from Best Buy, you have a 14-day window to t- return that camera, right? And so if you're 14 days away from Christmas, I would maybe hold off on that because they're going to open that and you can't even exchange it yet. Uh, Best Buy doesn't have a great... Apple makes wonderful products, not really known for their exchange policies. But then there is the undefeated, undisputed champion of all exchange policies. You guys know what I'm talking about, Costco. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Costco. Except for during COVID, I saw this sign. They got a little tight. Everyone got a little weird during COVID, even Costco. So we'll give them some grace. Returns will not be accepted on toilet paper, paper towel, sanitizing wipe, 
water, rice, Lysol. Some of you guys that went too crazy, you know, like, I should probably take this back, you know. And they're like, no, we're not going to take it back. But Costco is pretty, pretty exceptional on their exchange policy. I was reading this past week uh, about some things that have been exchanged from Costco that Costco actually took back and refunded. Number one, a half-eaten rotisserie chicken. Like, it's like five, it's like six dollars. It's like the best priced rotisserie chicken, right? And someone exchanged it and they took it back. Someone once exchanged an 11-year-old pillow, an 11-year-old pillow. Someone once exchanged successfully cat food without a bag. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Someone once exchanged successfully 14-year-old frozen fish because they put it in their freezer, they forgot about it, and Costco took it back. But the one that takes the cake tonight is, and by the way, when I, when I try to go and find illustrations like this, I like to fact check myself just to make sure it's accurate. So I fact checked this particular item, and sometimes it just comes back better than I expected, because not only did I find it was true, I found a picture of it. Someone returned a Christmas tree after Christmas. January the 4th, re- returned a Christmas tree to Costco, a dead Christmas tree. Now there are signs, now they will not let you return a Christmas tree because someone already tried it. So uh, let me just tell you this. The greatest exchange program our world has ever known is the redemption that Jesus offers. No one has a better exchange program. Here's what he does. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we read, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. His sin, uh, our sin for his righteousness. Isn't that great? I said it wrong. That would have been really bad. I'm glad I corrected it. His righteousness for our sin. Christ was sinless. That's awesome. That is what Christ exchanges for us. And then we read here in this passage in in, uh, 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 Isaiah chapter 61, to give them beauty for ashes. I'm going to take their ashes. And of course, we know in the Old Testament, sometimes they would put ashes on their heads during times of mourning. I'm going to give them beauty for ashes. I will give them oil of joy for their mourning. I will give them a garment of praise for their heaviness. Uh, God, there's beauty in in the redemption of Jesus Christ, the goodness of God, and then the grace of redemption that he came uh, not to be ministered unto, but to minister to others, the Bible says, and to provide for us redemption, not just through the cradle, but on the cross of Calvary. Here's the last, here's the last reason that we should be praising and singing joy continually. It's this, the glory of the nations, the glory of the nations. So back to Luke. I know we're going back and forth. Back in Luke chapter number four, what was the response when Jesus opened the scrolls, when he read Isaiah 61, or what is known to us as Isaiah 61? When he read that, what was the response? What kind of reception did he get? Well, in verse number 22, it says, And all bear him witness and wondered at his gracious words, which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? So they're not really thrilled about it. This is his hometown, right? They, they'd, seen, they not, they'd seen him grow up. They'd never seen him sin because Jesus never sinned. But they'd seen him around. Jesus was known to them. And he says, isn't that, aren't, there great, aren't those nice words that he's saying? Like he just claimed to be the Messiah and his hometown's like, that's sweet. Isn't this Joe's son? Like who's, is this, this is Joseph's son, right? Isn't that, he's so eloquent in the way he speaks. Verse number 24, which led Jesus to say, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And then he said this in verse number 25. But I tell of you the truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, Elias is Elijah, when heaven was shut up three years and six months, when a great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city in Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Then he says in verse number 17, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias. This is Elisha, the prophet. And none of them were cleansed, save Naaman, saving Naaman, the Syrian. So how did they respond to this? Verse number 28. And all they in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath. That's pretty quickly things escalated. Jesus speaks from, reads from Isaiah 61 concerning himself. He says, that's me. They say, isn't that cute? This is Joseph's son. Jesus says, you don't get it. 
uh, prophets uh, without honor in his own country. And then he, and then he goes to these verses. What is, he, what is he doing here when he gives an example of Elijah and Elisha? He's saying there's a lot of widows in Israel. Uh, there are a lot of people with leprosy in Israel. But what did, what, who were the prophets sent to? Someone of Sidon and Naaman the Syrian. And what Jesus is doing here is speaking of the wideness of his grace. And so they are not happy with it. They're filled with wrath. Verse number 29. And rose up and thrust him out of the city. Some of you that have toured in the Holy Land have perhaps been to a spot where they say this is, this is a high area in Nazareth. This could have been the place where they took Jesus and this event occurred. They led him up into the brow of the hill wherein their city was built that they may cast him. So he is just getting started here in his earthly ministry and they're already ready to kill him. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. So what angered them is beautiful to our ears. And what is that? In Acts chapter number 28, we read, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles that they will hear it. What does that mean? That we are included. That God's grace is not just for his chosen people is Israel but that salvation is available to every single one of us, to the nation. Listen, God doesn't just save us then, he includes us and he builds us up. Look at verse number three back in Isaiah 61, and we're almost done. In verse number three of Isaiah 61, we read, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build up old waste and shall raise up former desolations and shall repair the waste cities, the desolation of many generations. I want you to make note of this, that the brokenhearted in verse number two are now the builders in verse number four. Why and to what end? For the glory of God. That's what God does with us. That's why he, he is so gracious, not just to save us, but then to include us, to make us trees of righteousness. Not to build us up for our glory so people are impressed with what we can do, but that through us, he will work for his glory. Isn't that awesome? What is your testimony? How are you poor, sick, brokenhearted, captive, blind? God can use that. We see God do that every week here at Lancaster Baptist. And it's not just here. It's tonight happening in El Salvador. It's happening in the Philippines. It's happening in Africa. God redeeming people in closed communist countries uh, and in prosperous, wealthy nations, young and old, male and female, Jew and Gentile, Galatians chapter number three. God is, his redeeming hand is at work. And we can be grateful for that. Now, how does this resonate with you? Nazareth was angered. Rome was indifferent. But how do you respond? In verse number 10 of Isaiah 61, we read, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. A pretty simple response tonight. To let the praise of his goodness be always and continually on our lips. To keep in perspective that we are nothing apart from the grace and the goodness of God. I read of Isaac Watts. And Isaac Watts, at the age of five, learned how to speak Latin. At nine, he was fluent in Greek. At 11, French. And at 13, he had mastered Hebrew. Uh, by the way, your parents, your child is probably not an Isaac Watts. But I do think we can hold kids today to a higher level of accountability than our society does. Here's a, here's a, here's a kid, again, he's, he's a prodigy, right? But he's 5, 9, 13 years old. He's learning multiple languages. And sometimes I'm told, like, oh, this is a hard book to read or this is a hard book to finish. Or how can I expect this, you know? And I, and I get that. But our society has lowered the bar continually, right? That's just a side note. So Isaac Watts, he was attending services week after week. He wasn't really impressed with the, the music and the lyrics that were being sung. He expressed these views to his father at the time of 15. His father didn't really ignore him, but he challenged him to come up with something better. So we went home that Sunday, and at the evening service, Isaac Watts comes back in 1719, and he present, presents his first song to the congregation, Joy to the World. And it was meant more than just a Christmas carol. It was originally based off uh, 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 Psalm 68. 
And Watts said he had seen his congregation, even as a 15-year-old, he had seen his congregation and how they worshiped. Here's what he said. To see the dull indifference, the negligent and thoughtless air that sits upon the faces of the whole assembly while the psalm is upon their lips might even tempt a charitable observer to suspect the fervency of their inward religion. And so he writes joy to the world. What is he saying? He's like, he's saying, I'm observing people that are, that are singing and quoting Psalm 698 and great, great psalms and scripture like this, but, but not as if they mean it, not if it, though it means anything to them. So he penned the words, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let all their songs employ while fields and floods, rock hills and plains, repeat the sounding joy. Repeat the sounding joy. You know, we too can become overtaken by indifference sometimes concerning the wonderful truths, even at Christmas, can't we? Uh, we go through the busyness of the season. This is a moment where we're supposed to have time with family and reflect, but it really just seems like the closer we get towards the end of the year, the crazier it gets. And year after year, it, even, it's, it seems uh, that, the, that the schedule can sometimes even get more chaotic. And, and there's seasons of life. I understand that. But the joy of our salvation should frequently overtake our hearts, meaning there should be moments where we pause with immense gratitude, Overtaken by the joy of what God has done for us. What Psalm 61 means for us. Repeat the sounding joy. I've given you three reasons tonight from Isaiah 61. Why? Because God is good. Because he is good, you can trust his hand, you can trust his heart. He is at work. Because Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer. He'll exchange your your brokenness. He'll, He'll mend your heart. He'll set the captive free. Jesus is better than anything this world can offer. And then, here's, here's the final note. We can bring him glory. In Psalm 61, in verse number, I believe it is uh, verse number six, we read it. It's multiple times throughout this, this passage. Uh, verse number three, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Verse number six. Uh, it also speaks to the believer priests and the, the, you shall glory uh, in their glory and ye will boast yourselves. Why? For the glory of God. 